Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on cancer. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to see how um, how P53, this protein that we've seen in the previous videos, uh, how it's also, apart from just being involved in the DNA damage, um, the DNA damage pathway and uh, in that pathway, activating uh, DNA repair mechanisms, activating uh, the halting of the cell cycle, and activating apoptosis if its signal uh, is large enough and maintained for long enough. Well, apart from being involved in that pathway, it's also involved in sensing mitogen overactivity. So really, in this video, what we're looking at is the way in which you sense mitogen overactivity, basically, and how uh, P53 is involved in responding to that, basically, and stopping the cell from dividing and potentially uh, causing the cell to apoptose if you're getting mitogen overactivity. So what do I mean by mitogen activity? Well, basically, we need to know what a mitogen is. Basically, a mitogen is any uh, substance or, uh, or uh, biological compound or protein or something uh, which causes um, which causes the cell to divide. So it's any pro division, pro division species basically. So pro division species, and by species I mean chemical or um, protein or whatever basically. Okay, so it's something that causes the cell to divide. So growth factors are a example of a mitogen. In this video, what we're going to see is how growth factors acting through the growth factor receptor can lead to the activation of uh, MYC or CMYC, uh, and uh, that can lead to um, that can lead basically to um, the activation of p53 if the levels of MYC get too high, basically within the cell. So, if the cell basically is being overstimulated to divide, then uh, basically P53 is a safety system. It says, no, this isn't right. There's something gone horribly wrong here. We shouldn't have this level of stimulation to divide. We're going to stop. We're going to kill, kill ourselves, or we're going to halt the cell cycle, and we're going to stop this. We're going to ignore this sig uh, signal, basically. And it's a protection, a very powerful protection against cancer. And indeed, nearly all tumors uh, nearly all cancers have mutations in p53 for this reason. In fact, I think it's 50% of tumours that have mutations in p53, so not nearly all half. Um, but the point is that in order to actually get a cancer, in order to get this uncontrolled proliferation, really, you have to have p53 defunctional, because if not, P53 will say, we're, we're dividing too much, basically. These mitogen levels in the cytoplasm are too high. Stop. And it will stop the cell dividing. So nearly all cancers have uh, some degree of P53 uh, loss of function, basically. Okay, so uh, let's see this pathway in full, basically. Let's begin with the growth factor, binding to its growth factor receptor. Let's go through this pathway, because it doesn't hurt to revise things. And uh, then let's see how MYC is going to lead to the activation of P53 if it gets in too high levels within the cytoplasm of the cell. That indicates to the cell that there's something severely wrong here, that I'm a cancerous cell, basically, potentially, and uh, P53 is then going to kill the cell. And then we'll talk about the correlates of this uh, for cancer and how um, P53 is almost nearly always has mutations in it in uh, cancer. And it's one of the early mutations in cancer. Okay, right. Uh, so, let's begin then with our cell, which we are going to stimulate with growth factors, basically. Okay. So, uh, we're going to put growth factors on this cell. And we want to revise, basically, how these growth factors are going to affect the um, cell. Okay, right. So, let's take a little piece of the cell membrane of this cell. So, let's say this is the phospholipid bilayer of our cell. And in the phospholipid bilayer, let's say we have the growth factor receptor for this growth factor that we are secreting onto our cell. So, this is the growth factor receptor.
okay? And uh, let me color it in. So we'll have it in orange. It's the color I usually color growth factor receptors in, so we'll outline it in orange. So this is a growth factor receptor. And we know that uh, when growth factors bind to these growth factor receptors, it's going to cause a conformational change. And in fact, they're going to dimerize together. When this conformational change occurs, they are... Um, they are put into a new conformation which allows them to dimerize together. So let's say this here is our growth factor binding to our growth factor receptor. Okay, so here is our growth factor here in green. Now I'm keeping this very general deliberately, um, but if you want a concrete example of a growth factor, then you can think of epidermal growth factor. So epidermal growth factor is a specific example of a growth factor which uses this pathway which we're going to talk about. So GF for growth factor. So you would denote epidermal growth factor usually as EGF. And then the receptor for the epidermal growth factor would be the epidermal growth factor receptor or the EGFR. But more generally, this is just going to be our growth and I've managed to put an A instead of an O instead. I'm doing that to, uh, to continuously at the moment. Growth factor receptor. I don't know what's wrong with me. Growth factor receptor. Okay, so there's our growth factor receptor. Uh, so um, in the case of epidermal growth factor, this would be the epidermal growth factor receptor, the EGFR. Right, so the growth factor is going to come and bind to the extracellular domain of the growth factor. And when it does that, it's going to change the conformation of um, the growth factor receptor, basically. So we will show that, as far as this cartoon is concerned, like so. So it's made available some sort of domain which is involved in the dimerization. Okay, and this is important now why, uh, well, this we explains why I've drawn two of these. So let's say we've got another one here now, which has also bound to its growth factor and has also now taken on this conformation where it can dimerize, okay? So let me highlight them in to make it more obvious. So in orange, we have this growth factor receptor and it's now uh, changed conformation because it's got the growth factor bound to it and it's now in a position to dimerize with another growth factor receptor which has been uh, activated by binding to growth factor. So growth factor in green here. Okay, right. So now what's going to happen is these two activated growth factor receptors are going to dimerize together. So what's going to happen is you're going to get a dimer here. Okay, so here's the phospholipid bilayer. I'll draw it a bit bigger because I think it's probably difficult to see in this light. Okay, so there is the, um, there's the growth factor receptor and the two of them have now dimerized together. Okay, and both of them still have the growth factor bound to the extracellular domains here. So, growth factor in green. Okay, and then I'll color in the growth factor receptor in orange. Okay, and they've dimerized together to form this dimer of the growth factor receptor. Right, so the next stage is what's known as autophosphorylation. And basically, uh, these, um, these intracellular domains of these growth factor receptors have uh, tyrosine residues. So let me remind you of the structure of the amino acid tyrosine. So let's start by drawing the basic structure of the amino acid. So here is uh, the amino group over here. Then there's the carboxyl group, also off the alpha carbon down here. And then also off the alpha carbon, which is the name for this middle carbon here, uh, you have a hydrogen coming off, and then you have the R group coming off here. And in the case of tyrosine, the R group is a methylene group, then uh, linked to a benzene ring here, so this is benzene, and then a hydroxyl group coming off the fourth carbon of the benzene ring. So this is the structure of tyrosine. Okay, right. So, uh, in the intra on the intracellular aspect of these growth factor receptors, there are lots of these tyrosine residues, basically. So you have many tyrosine residues on the intracellular aspect of this growth factor receptor. Okay, now, uh, what happens is a process known as autophosphorylation. Okay, and this means that um, the uh, growth factor receptor um, dimer uh, 
uh, phosphor well, basically, let me label these up. So let's call the first member of this dimer growth factor receptor 1, and let's call the second member of this dimer uh, growth factor re um, receptor 2. Okay, what's going to happen is that growth factor receptor 1 is going to have a... Um, catalytic subunit, which is a tyrosine kinase, which is why these growth factor receptors are often known as receptor tyrosine kinases. So you'll see, the, you'll hear that a lot, receptor tyrosine kinases. And it's because they have a, uh, a subunit of them, which is a tyrosine kinase, i.e. it adds phosphate groups onto tyrosine residues. Okay, so basically this tyrosine kinase domain of growth factor receptor 1 is going to phosphorylate the tyrosine residues on growth factor receptor 2. And growth factor receptor 2 is going to reciprocate for growth factor receptor 1, i.e. the tyrosine kinase of uh, growth factor receptor 2 is going to phosphorylate the tyrosine residues of growth factor receptor 1. And that process is known as autophosphorylation. Okay, and um, basically that activates uh, the growth factor receptor dimer. So let's draw the receptor here now, and we'll draw some uh, pink blobs on to denote phosphate groups. So here is our um, tyros receptor tyrosine kinase dimer, so our growth factor receptor dimer here. They're still both bound to growth factor here, so these are growth factors molecules here. Okay. And uh, then uh, on the intracellular aspect, you have these tyrosine residues here, which now have had phosphate groups put on them. So here are the phosphate groups in pink. OK, so you now have these phosphorylated tyrosine residues. Now, um, there is a um, protein which is going to come and associate with these phosphorylated tyrosine residues. And that protein is known as the growth factor receptor binding protein 2. Okay, so it's going to come and bind to these phosphorylated tyrosine residues. So I'll draw it like so. Okay, it's come and bound here. I, I can't really draw it any more binding to them uh, without ruining the picture. Uh, but it's binding to the phosphorylated tyrosine residues, so it's required the phosphorylation of the tyrosine residues in order to bind. And this is growth factor, it's got a long name, growth factor, let me move this over here, growth factor receptor binding protein 2, receptor binding protein 2. And that's a bit of a mouthful. So people often just abbreviate it to GRB2. So they, for some reason, the F and the P don't get mentioned. Instead, we just have growth receptor binding 2. OK, so GRB2. That's the GRB2 protein. OK, so what color should I draw GRB2 in? Draw it in blue here. OK, so, so far, we've got to the binding of GRB2 onto our uh, phosphorylated tyrosines of our receptor tyrosine kinase. In the next video, we'll see what happens next.